Good morning, Vet Science class. Day three, here we are. A uh, couple of housekeeping things before we get started today. Everybody's been turning in their work, and I'm sorry that um, there may have been some vagueness. I My intention was you all do this sheet uh, as after you, you take your notes and then you share this with me. That way I know that you've got it. We're going to go through today the whipworm, um, some protozoa, and then finish up with heartworm. And then that'll get us um, pretty well set on common internal parasites, get you ready for the EOP, the final, and all that. Um, there was a question about types on this worksheet yesterday. And if we refer back to the slideshow, this could have been interpreted two ways. My intention actually probably wasn't uh, what most of you did. And that was, was it an endo or an ecto type of parasite? And that's fine because if we go back through the notes, um, you know, some of these, um, some of these, oh, come on, there, it's going very fast. Some of these internal parasites, they have a separation on type. So Toxocara canis, Toxocara cati, cati Toxocarsis uh, leonia for dog and cat. So if you put those, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, originally, I did this worksheet. I would just turn you loose on internal and external parasites, let you do some digging for the day, and you would classify it by type as, inter uh, as ecto or endo. Um, but obviously that's not what we're doing now. So types on this using this block, that's perfect. Um, or you can put endo ecto. I mean, obviously we're working on internal parasites, so they're all going to be endo. Uh, anyway, without further ado, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. That way you can get done. So objective for today is finish up common internal parasites and protozoa. Uh, the sheet will be posted. You'll just go through, finish up your notes on um, whipworm, the protozoa, and heartworm. And then I've got an article that kind of goes through uh, the different types of parasites. On Monday, we'll talk about collecting those and sampling for those. So you'll read through this, you'll answer those questions, share those with me as well as your outline, and we should be all set. If you have any questions, you can email me. All right. Let's talk about parasites. So, yesterday we had left off with the hookworm. And we talked about those clinical signs. We'll move into whipworm. Whipworm, to me, kind of always looked like a, a segmented chain or the, the link of a chain. And I can envision these little... Uh, whipworm eggs being connected to one another and they've been ripped off. So uh, they have the defined ends and then there's this cluster of cells in the middle. The whipworm gets its name from its whip-like tail structure. So it looks like a whip. So find representative pictures of those. Um, move my picture here. Come back. There we go. So the whipworm is pretty rare in cats, most common in dogs. Uh, the adult worms are going to have that whip-like tail. They attach to the large intestine, very common in horses too. Uh, we see that tail actually threads through the cecum. And again, they're absorbing those nutrients through the blood that's passing by that intestinal lining. So you can pause, write this down. The type, Trichurus vulpus. Mode of transmission, directly ingest whipworm eggs. The life cycle, so the eggs are eaten. I'm gonna move my picture again. The larvae attach and begin their development in the small and large intestine. They mature in the cecum or in the large intestine. The eggs contain infective larvae that are again, again passed through the feces and then the cycle begins. So if that a horse is depositing these droppings in a pasture and the larvae aren't left dormant long enough, they could re-ingest them pretty quickly. Signs, diarrhea, emaciation, dehydration, anemia, or blood in the stool, again because they're infecting that intestinal lining. 
So again, feel free to go back and pause, write those in your notes, update your sheet that you're gonna share with me, okay? Up next, we've got protozoa. Move my picture again. Protozoa, if you, if you don't know it, it's a unicellular organism that uh, can perform all functions. So they can respire, they can digest food, they can excrete that digested food, and then they can reproduce. Within the livestock industry and within pets, we have three key protozoa players, coccidia, giardia, and liver flukes. There is not an adult versus an egg stage. This is just what they are. So because they're that unicellular organism, this is how they are. Coccidia looks like a deviled egg. If you ask me, you cut a hard boiled egg in half, that's what you've got. Giardia reminds me of a jellyfish. So I remember it that way. And then liver flukes, when that they're on the slide of a microscope, they look like a liver color. So they're pretty easy to separate out. Coccidia, giardia, and liver flukes. So let's talk about them. Uh, coccidia infest the, in, the walls of the intestine. Um, coccidia has several different species. It's most commonly seen in the water. Um, and then we've got the types here. I don't know if I can move this little box somewhere. That might make life easier. There we go. Okay. Isospera, Scarcocytis, and Plax, Plax, Toxoplas gandhi. Plasma gandhi. Good Latin there, Anderson. So there are your three types. Modes of transmission, directly ingested, ingesting the eggs. So again, commonly through water here in Kentucky, and then ingestion ingestion of infected animals. So if you're a cat eating a rat that's got it or a mouse that's got it. Eggs are ingested by the animal um, from a host and then the parasites cell walls digested and enters the epithelial cells of the intestines. As they mature, the eggs divide and develop into male and female. And they're fertilized and pass through the feces, and the cycle just continues. So you can pause this, write that down. Most commonly, we're going to see extreme diarrhea. Um, having had sheep my whole life, if that, you know, the diarrhea, the feces that a sheep has when it's affected by coccidia is very... Um, particular to that protozoa. The last one that we're going to talk about are heartworms and heartworms don't necessarily have that. They're so small when that they start to develop that when we dye that microscopic slide, when we put that pigment on there, we can actually see the, the microfilaria there. As they develop, it looks like very fine angel hair pasta that's infected the heart. So uh, when we go through this, I will give you, obviously, the heart on the heartworm because they look so similar to a roundworm. Heartworms can affect dogs, cats, and even humans. Adult heartworms live in the right side of the heart and in the pulmonary artery. Worms are free living, meaning they do not attach to the host body. So here's a vector. We've got mosquitoes that transmit heartworm, uh, and the heartworm is prevalent in the southern states in warmer climate. The lar climates, the larvae need warm temperatures to mature. There are greater numbers of mosquitoes there. And we're talking like Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana. Lots of stagnant water in those areas. Uh, one thing about heartworm, heartworm can be prevented by uh, providing your pet with a tab each month. Uh, this typically affects dogs. Um, they're, the resolution for heartworms once they get them, so if that you, you lapse in administering heartworm meds to your dog, most, one of the most common is heart guard. 
um, they actually require you to give the test because if you're giving your dog uh, the preventative, it's kind of pointless. Rectifying or a resolution for heartworms is very costly. Um, very, very few cases have actually functioned to, to uh, provide a dog with uh, a, a good quality of life. What they have to do is open up the chest cavity, open the heart, physically remove the worms, and then continue the process of administering the heart guard to, to get rid of the microfilaria. And they sew the heart back up and they hope this muscle works. And it's very painful for the dog, I'm assuming. And sometimes uh, the heartworms just redevelop. So once they have it, 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 it's very hard to cure and it's very costly. So the life cycle on this, the mosquito bites the infected animal, the mosquito takes uh, its next meal and it has that larvae in there and it's passed to the next animal and then it migrates to the right side of the heart and the heartworms begin producing that microfilaria and then it just goes back into the bloodstream. Signs, they're gonna try and cough. Uh, they have an irregular heartbeat. Um, they just, their movement's very limited. Um, if that, they're just starting to develop, they could be asymptomatic, meaning we don't see much change in their, their body. Um, if that they have them, they're going to live about five years. Cats will only live one to three years. Um, there, again, there's not much that you can do outside of just letting them live life. If that their quality of life progresses significantly, exploring, um, euthanasia might be the best option. So we've got that guys. What I want you to do is take that information, um, put in your notes, share that sheet with me, read through the internal parasites article, answer those questions, share those answers with me, and we will call it good until Monday. I appreciate your all's time. Email me if you have any questions and we will talk from there. Have a good weekend, everybody. See you on Monday.